We all remember the first time we went on a roller coaster that goes upside down. It almost feels like a rite of passage. To take on that intimidating moment of being flipped upside down, it really makes for a thrilling ride. Nowadays, many thrill coasters go upside down in a variety of different ways, always safely, efficiently, and for maximum thrills. But it hasn't always been that way. It took many failed attempts and decades of technological development before roller coasters were able to safely invert. So where did that journey begin? And how did we get to where we are today? This is a full history of the roller coaster inversion. To trace the beginnings of the roller coaster inversion, we have to go back almost as far as the roller coaster itself. The first wheeled roller coasters were invented in Russia in the late 18th century as a summer adaptation of the common winter pastime of sledding down ice covered ramps. These early inventions, known as Russian mountains, stood between 70 and 80 feet tall, with a 50 degree drop supported by wooden beams. These designs quickly spread throughout Europe, most notably to France, where several larger adaptations were constructed in Paris. In 1833, a French engineer named Claviers created the first design of a roller coaster ever to feature an inversion. An adaptation of the Russian mountains, this design featured a simple downward ramp leading into a vertical loop before an ascending ramp that made the design similar to modern shuttle coasters. However, Clavier's design would not be implemented into a functioning ride until a decade later in 1843, when designers Hutchinson and Higgins debuted their Centrifugal Iron Railway, which toured to theatres in various British cities including London, Manchester and Liverpool. The novelty and pure audacity of the looping railway concept led to a permanent installation, the first permanent roller coaster to feature an inversion, the Centrifugal Railway at the Frascati Gardens in Le Havre, France, which opened in 1846. This coaster featured a 43-foot drop into a 13-foot loop. These 1840s Centrifugal Railways were extensively tested as the idea of inverting riders had never been attempted on this scale before. The operators would send sandbags, egg crates, glasses of water, and even a monkey through the inversion in the development of the ride, ensuring the safety of the railway for its riders. While most of the installations would go their entire short operating lives with no actual safety incidents reported, one version at the Cirque Napoleon in 1865 was closed down after the first car sent through the loop completely derailed. Installations opened in several other French cities, including Bordeaux and Lyon, but the rides ultimately proved to be unpopular and would not last very long, with no further looping coasters being built for another 20 years. While not many first-hand accounts of the centrifugal railways exist, they did become something of a cultural phenomenon. Often operating as a circus or sideshow-like act, operators would exaggerate the scale of the rides, claiming that they would reach incredible speeds of up to 150 miles per hour. This association with the more dishonest showmanship of circuses and sideshows, as well as the general discomfort caused by the ride itself, resulted in the models being quite unpopular and even being the target of derision and controversy. Within a matter of a couple of decades of their invention, the centrifugal railways quickly died out. However, the simple loop-the-loop -loop ride model would be revived just decades later. American designer Lena Beecher sought to adapt the concept and bring it to the United States in the form of the Flip Flap Railway. This infamous coaster was constructed and tested in Toledo, Ohio in 1888, before the coaster was moved to Coney Island in New York to begin testing with sandbags and monkeys. This model featured a single rail with two riders seated in tandem. Beecher's coaster opened at Luna Park on Coney Island, then known as Sea Lion Park, in 1895. Much like the earlier centrifugal railways, the Flip Flap Railway was notorious for the G-force produced on its riders. Due to the fact that the loop was circular and only around 25 feet in diameter, it is estimated that the ride could induce forces of up to 12 Gs on riders, which is 3 Gs higher than what fighter jet pilots usually have to sustain. This resulted in frequent neck discomfort and whiplash injuries among riders. The general unpopularity of the ride, as well as the difficulties of profiting on a ride with such low capacity, meant that when Sea Lion Park was closed in 1902 and replaced with Luna Park, the ride did not survive. 
However, in 1901, designer Edward Green took the lessons learned from the Flip Flap Railway to produce Coney Island's second looping coaster, known simply as Loop the Loop. This coaster featured racing tracks with cars of four riders each, greatly improving the ride's capacity. But more importantly, Green improved the comfort of the ride by incorporating an elliptical shape into the loop. Modern loops are shaped like an ellipse or like a teardrop because the more gradual angle of ascent and descent reduces the positive g-force imposed on riders during the fastest points of the inversion when the force would be most extreme. On a modern loop, the tightest radius is at the peak of the loop where the train is moving slowest, which significantly reduces the amount of stress on riders and the trains. As a result, Loop the Loop was far more popular than Flip Flap Railway had ever been and would last longer, eventually being scrapped in 1910. Its primary issue continued to be capacity, as while the throughput had essentially quadrupled compared to Flip Flap Railway, roller coasters had continued to evolve and could put through entire full-length trains of riders at a time. Safety inspectors would not allow more than one car to be added to the Loop the Loop due to the G-force and concerns over derailments, so Coney Island attempted to supplement the ride's income through a pay-per-use viewing gallery of the loops. However, when this strategy failed, the ride was scrapped. Various similar coasters would operate throughout the United States in the 1900s and 1910s, but all faced similar issues of unpopularity and low throughput. As a result, there was little demand from parks for looping coasters, and the rides disappeared, this time with no inversions reappearing on roller coasters for almost 60 years. The idea of a roller coaster inverting its riders would remain a pipe dream for the first half of the 20th century. Until the 1950s, roller coasters were almost universally made from wood, which did not have the structural strength and capacity to safely pull off an inversion. Train designs were also an issue. While the upstop wheel had been invented by John Miller in the early 20th century, wheel assemblies were not yet designed with bearing the entire weight of the train on the upstop wheels in mind. They were simply designed with the intent of bearing negative g-forces during airtime moments to prevent derailments, and nothing more. Steel roller coasters had existed during that time as well, but were far less common due to the cost of steel compared to timber. The majority of steel coasters constructed in the first half of the 20th century were small family or children's coasters, particularly Little Dipper models. Through the 1950s, however, manufacturers began to recognize the inherent advantages of using steel over wood, namely its smoothness, durability, and of course, structural strength. Larger steel roller coasters gradually began to appear from manufacturers like Togo, who built the roller coaster at Japan's Hanayashiki in 1953. Myler, who began to manufacture their steel wild mouse models, and of course, Arrow Development. The California-based Arrow revolutionized roller coaster design in 1959, when they opened the Matterhorn bobsleds at Disneyland in Anaheim. This large-scale attraction in Walt Disney's brand new theme park would not only propel Arrow to the forefront of the amusement industry, but would change steel roller coaster design forever by becoming the first to utilize a tubular steel track. By using tubular steel rails, Arrow were able to make their steel track more capable of enduring high amounts of stress and g-force. The tubular design would allow Arrow to prefabricate the track and bend it into large curved segments, giving designers greater capability to bank and curve the track to absorb g-forces while relying on less welds and joins that could become potential weak spots under stress. This meant that even compared to other steel roller coasters of the time, the tubular steel design introduced on Matterhorn bobsleds was far stronger and capable of much more forceful maneuvers than ever before. Other manufacturers were quick to catch on to this design and introduce tubular rails into their own coasters, but Arrow would use it again to revolutionize roller coasters a decade later. In 1968, Carl Bacon, one of Arrow's founders and lead designers, came up with a prototype for the corkscrew model. This proof of concept was tested and successfully proved that tubular steel was capable of executing inversions both safely and reliably, this time not in the form of a vertical loop, but in the form of two corkscrew inversions. The idea of a roller coaster that could safely, comfortably and reliably take its riders upside down was huge for the theme park industry. Not only was the full model of Arrow's corkscrew prototype purchased by California's Knott's Berry Farm, becoming the first modern inverting roller coaster and the first coaster with two inversions upon its opening in 1975, but three other parks would purchase exact replicas that would open within days of Knott's, 
and by 1979 there were 10 corkscrew clones operating in California, Tennessee, Illinois, South Carolina, Missouri, Florida, Ohio, Michigan, and even three in Japan. By 1976, Arrow were even confident enough in their tubular steel design to take on the challenge that Lena Beecher had failed to accomplish all those years ago, installing the first modern coaster with a vertical loop at Cedar Point in Ohio. Arrow's clearly teardrop-shaped loop, combined with the structural strength and comparative smoothness of its steel track, meant that Cedar Point's corkscrew was a resounding success, and continues to operate to this day along with hundreds if not thousands of other vertical loops on roller coasters. With Arrow's success in reviving the inverting roller coaster, the development of inversions from the mid-1970s to today became not a question of whether roller coasters could go upside down, but in how many different ways they could go upside down, and how inversions could be incorporated into roller coaster designs to create more thrilling rides. Different inversion types, different ride types, and various record-breaking coasters would rapidly emerge over the next 45 years as manufacturers sought to find ways to use tubular steel track and inversions to create the next big thrill machine. One of the first big roller coaster ideas to come thanks to Arrow's innovation would come in 1977, thanks to German coaster designer Anton Schwarzkopf. Schwarzkopf is credited with the invention of the shuttle coaster concept, a roller coaster that does not complete a full circuit, but rather is propelled through an incomplete section of track before completing the same section in reverse. While not all shuttle coasters include inversions, Schwarzkopf's original concept was the now famous Shuttle Loop, a launched roller coaster design that originally used a weight drop powered launch to propel the train through a singular vertical loop. However, while Schwarzkopf was the one to invent the concept, it was actually Arrow who would be the first to bring the shuttle coaster concept to life with the first installation being Scream and Demon at Ohio's Kings Island in 1977, the first of Arrow's launched loop model. Meanwhile, Arrow were also looking for ways to make bigger and more eye-catching inverting coasters beyond their simple corkscrew layout. Their first opportunity to create a record-breaking looping coaster would come in 1978 at Virginia's Busch Gardens Williamsburg, the Loch Ness Monster. This would be the first roller coaster in history to feature interlocking loops, except for lightning loops at Six Flags Great Adventure, but that was just two launch loops linked together, so it doesn't really count. Loch Ness Monster opened as one of the tallest and fastest roller coasters in the world, costing a total of 5 million US dollars and being designed for two separate trains to complete the interlocking loops at the same time. Europe would get their first modern inverting roller coaster in 1979, with the opening of Revolution at England's Blackpool Pleasure Beach. This Arrow launch loop coaster still operates today. Gradually, Arrow would become more creative with their inversion types. In 1980, they opened Orient Express at Missouri's Worlds of Fun, which not only again featured interlocking loops, but introduced the Batwing element, then known as the Kamikaze Curve. This was the first inverting element to feature two back-to-back -back inversions, essentially the first half of a corkscrew leading into the exit of a loop, followed by the entry of a loop leading into the second half of a corkscrew. Finding new forms of inversions became an easy way for coaster manufacturers to create eye-catching rides that would generate hype and excitement among theme park visitors. Dutch manufacturer Vacoma introduced their take on the shuttle coaster in the 1980s, which introduced the Cobra Roll, another element to feature back-to-back -back inversions. These compact shuttle coasters, known as the Boomerang, became one of the most popular ride models in history, with over 50 of them still operating around the world today. Manufacturers also sought ways to make inversions more comfortable for riders. An example is the evolution of the inline twist into the Heartline Roll, spearheaded by Japanese manufacturer Togo in the 1980s. Togo, in the process of designing their famous Ultra Twister models, realized that trains twisting around the center axis of the track spine placed heavier g-forces onto riders. Instead, beginning with their Ultra Twisters and then continuing with their first looping coaster, Viper at Six Flags Great Adventure, Togo proposed to twist riders around a center axis fixed at the rider's chest level, which would place the stress on the trains instead, creating a more comfortable experience for riders. As inversions evolved, manufacturers learned to shape them more effectively to control the forces implemented on riders, the trains, and the track. As the form of inversions evolved, another focus became breaking the record for having the most inversions. 
Much like the height and speed records, the inversion record became highly coveted in the late 20th century among theme parks and roller coaster manufacturers, sparking something of an arms race to continually better the record. Initially though, there was only one competitor in that race, Arrow. They would open the first roller coaster to feature five inversions in 1982, Viper at Six Flags Darien Lake in New York. Five years later in 1987, they would better themselves again with the world's first six inversion coaster, Vortex at Kings Island. And then just a year later in 1988, the world's first seven inversion coaster, Shockwave at Six Flags Great America in Illinois. In 1995, however, another manufacturer announced their arrival as heavyweights in the inverting coaster game, Bollinger and Mabillard. The Swiss manufacturer broke the record with the world's first eight inversion coaster, Dragon Khan at Spain's Port Aventura. B&M had also changed the game a few years prior with the innovation of the world's first inverted coaster, Batman the Ride at Six Flags Great America. While many of the inverted coaster's inversion types would simply be adapted versions of sit-down inversions, B&M's inverted models would continue to innovate with the introduction of elements like the famous Zero-G roll. Throughout the late 20th century, the advancement of inversions in roller coasters had been all about breaking barriers. From the first successful inversion, to the first to do it eight times, Arrow had sparked a revolution of roller coasters created by designers who sought to push the limits. And Kings Island sought to start the 21st century off on the same note, by breaking a barrier that many perhaps thought impossible the first wooden coaster to feature an inversion. Kings Island contracted the Roller Coaster Corporation of America, or RCCA, to construct Son of Beast, a 218-foot behemoth of a wooden coaster that would feature a towering vertical loop. RCCA would accomplish the feat by making the loop the only section of track to be made from steel. Unfortunately, due to a combination of RCCA's negligence and cost-cutting measures, the loop would apparently be the only part of the coaster that was smooth. Son of Beast became a figurative headache for Kings Island and a literal headache for riders, with several incidents and design faults causing injuries and discomfort to its riders. Ultimately, Kings Island would remove the loop in 2007 in an effort to allow lighter trains to be used on the coaster and reduce wear on the track and supports, but this was also unsuccessful. Son of Beast was closed in 2009. But that's a story for another video. In any case, manufacturers would not be discouraged from adding inversions to wooden roller coasters as technology advanced, allowing for wooden coasters to be built with the necessary structural integrity. Examples such as Hades 360, Mindblower, and Goliath exist and operate today thanks to the efforts of manufacturers such as the Gravity Group and Rocky Mountain Construction. In the meantime, manufacturers were still trying to outpace each other in the inversion record game. England's Thorpe Park would have their say in 2002, opening Colossus, the first roller coaster to feature 10 inversions. This roller coaster was built by Swiss manufacturer Intamin and has since been cloned several times. But at the same time, Arrow, on the brink of bankruptcy, would have one last contribution to make to the world of inversions. Aerodynamics designer Alan Schilke introduced the concept of the fourth dimension coaster, a model that would leave quite the legacy, being regarded as one of the most intense roller coasters ever constructed, while also cementing Arrow's final and decisive bankruptcy. However, despite Arrow's demise, X at Six Flags Magic Mountain would successfully open to the public, featuring wing-style seating that utilizes a special extra set of rails to flip riders as the train moves through the layout. This same design would later become a point of controversy in the world record community thanks to its successor, Ejinaika, at Japan's Fuji Q Highland. Opening in 2006, Ejinaika was constructed by American manufacturer SNS, who acquired Arrow's assets upon their bankruptcy. This monstrosity took the concept even further, standing at a towering 76 meters tall while flipping riders upside down 14 times, even though the trains only invert three times. Debate raged over whether Air Janica should be considered the inversion record holder, but the controversy would soon be put to rest when another coaster claimed the record for its own. In 2013, the Smiler at England's Alton Towers, the prototype of German manufacturer Gerslauer's Infinity Coaster model, opened featuring 14 outright track inversions, a record that still stands today. While some might still argue that Air Janica stands as its equal, the Smiler remains the current inversion king. 
With the exception of a certain Saudi Arabian oil money project, coasters are no longer being built with the explicit intention of breaking world records, but rather with pushing the boundaries of roller coaster technology and seeking to create eye-catching rides through pure thrill and appeal rather than just statistics. This has included inversions. Today, there are dozens of different inversion types, all designed to produce different, unique sensations for riders. Let's look at some examples. Gerslauer's Infinity Coaster and Eurofighter models have become renowned for their unique elements and versatility, which includes many different inversion types such as the Dive Loop, Immelman, and the Banana Roll, which was introduced on what was then the world's steepest roller coaster, Takabisha. Another manufacturer to attempt to introduce unique and versatile elements is Maura Rides, who unveiled their revolutionary X-Car train design in the early 2000s. These trains were designed to be able to safely complete inversions using only a lap bar, and therefore emphasized hang time on their inversions, such as the Skyloop and the Bent Cuban 8. B&M have continued to innovate with their various inverting ride models, such as the Flawless, Inverted, Flying, and Wing Coasters. Their famous inversions include the Dive Drop, Pretzel Loop, and Zero G Roll. Vekoma, Mark, and Interman are all famous for their highly varied multi-looping coasters with a diverse mix of inverting elements, such as Wrath of Zeus at Vin Wonders Fu Quoc, Helix at Liseberg, and Velocicoaster at Universal's Islands of Adventure. And finally, a relatively new player on the inversion scene is Rocky Mountain Construction, who have become popular for their airtime-packed steel reconstructions of older wooden coasters. One of their most popular and well-received inversions is the Zero-G Stall, a breathtaking high-speed inverted moment. Today, there are 916 roller coasters in operation that feature at least one inversion, with a total of 2,821 different inversions worldwide. From over half a century of being considered almost impossible to spreading across the world, the roller coaster inversion has undergone quite the journey. Let me know in the comments section below what your first inverting roller coaster was and what your favorite inversions are. While you're there, please also give the video a like to help against the YouTube algorithm and click the subscribe button and the bell icon to be notified when I next upload. Don't forget to scan the QR code if you're interested in becoming a channel member and check out my latest videos from my journey to every country in the world. Thank you so much for watching and I'll see you next time.